What's up, everyone? Welcome back to Adventures Through the Mind. I am your host, as always, James W. Gesso. Today's episode is with Chad Charles. You're going to learn about him in a second. But first, big shout out to my patrons on Patreon who make this podcast possible for everybody else. So thank you, patrons, very much so. Uh, A special thank you, as this will be the last podcast episode of the year, um, for making this year so incredible for me. Um, If it wasn't for my patronage and the people who care about this show enough to put financially in, voluntarily put financially in to help support it, I wouldn't have been able to produce it and a lot of people wouldn't have been able to learn from it and enjoy it. And yeah, I'm just feeling super grateful. So just starting the podcast off like that. Uh, Also, big thanks to the people whose names are listed on the screen. They give significantly. Um, If you're watching on YouTube, you see their names. If you're watching it anywhere else or listening to it, they are listed in the show notes. Um, But ultimately, a huge thank you to my patrons in general, because without you guys, yeah, it wouldn't be happening. So thank you. Uh, if you want to become a patron, if you're not one yet, head to patreon.com forward slash James W. Gesso to do so. There's some cool perks there. Example, getting your name up on the screen, $23 or more, getting access to a an exclusive Dropbox folder with a whack ton of content um, for $8 plus a month. Just go check it out. That'd be awesome. Alternatively, you can buy something from my shop, copies of my book. Uh, These are ways to financially support the show. It all leans into the same sort of like um, economy of support. Uh, Or you could leave me a single PayPal donation like Lobardo recently did very generously. In fact, so thank you very much, Lobardo. Details about that are at jameswgesso.com forward slash support. Today's episode, we're going to get into that. I'm making this a little bit of a longer intro. It is the last podcast of the year, um, and I have an important announcement, um, which might be relevant to you, so thanks for continuing to tune in. The relevant announcement is that I am taking a break um, for the month of January, and so this is the last podcast that we'll be releasing until January 31st. So the reason I'm taking this break is to enjoy the Christmas holidays with family and friends, of course, but Also, since getting back from the tour, I've been going through this process of what I call cleaning up, clearing up, and catching up in order to set up for a really excellent year of not only podcasting, but also a bunch of other content that I feel super inspired to put out um, that uh, is actually interrelated to me taking an entire year off of uh, teaching, touring, in order to double down on this content for all of you um, and also for my commitment to my life path towards psychedelic uh, culture and helping to be involved with and um, you know contribute to psychedelic culture. So I'm taking the two episode break for those reasons. Now it's two episode break from the podcast releasing, but it won't be a whole month of without content. So if you are not already following me on social media at James W. Gesso, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. Uh, That is where I will be releasing the content that's coming out. Some stuff left over from Breaking Convention. I'm working really intensely on this Clips channel right now that I just started at Mind Clips, which is a separate uh, YouTube channel, which has like more shareable uh, clips from different episodes. Um, You know, it's easier to share and have someone watch 10 minutes than two hours. I mean, I'm well aware of that uh, for myself even. Uh, So wanting to really double down and clip a bunch of old episodes with your support and support of the people on the Reddit to uh, offer me timestamps and pieces they felt was really relevant from old episodes that they'd like to see clipped out so that they could share, which I offer you the opportunity to send me that info as well. Um, And then other things that I'm working on that I feel excited about Um, and definitely feeling very, very interested and excited about the people that I'm going to have coming up for you over this year of podcasting um, that this two episode break will help me sort of get the ball rolling on. So that's the announcement. I'm going to be out of releasing podcasts for the month of January or at least until January 31st. Um, Another announcement is I will be... um, For any of you living in Ontario, specifically southwestern Ontario near Kitchener, where I live, uh, I will be heading a panel after the Dost documentary screening January 13th at the Apollo, 
Also on the panel will include Trevor Miller, who is the chair for Maps Canada. And uh, this is a project I'm really excited about. I'm helping bring this documentary in. I'm helping to what I see as contribute to psychedelic culture um, and psychedelic community in Kitchener, but also the destigmatizing of psychedelic medicines, especially for people in addictions work and in uh, social work, which is a big part of the documentary. So love for you to come out. I'll put a link in the show notes to this episode or somewhere around anywhere related to me. It should be easy to find a link to it. And I would love for you to come out again, January 13th um, in Kitchener, Ontario at the Apollo Cinema. So that is the part, the extended part of the intro. Thank you for not buffering right through it, although you could have, and I respect that. Uh, Chad Charles is on the show today. Chad Charles is a conscious, connected breathwork practitioner, intimacy arrows educator, and 5-MEO DMT-assisted body-based therapist. His interest in the direct felt experience of oneness inspires him to co-create projects that bring practitioners together in hopes that the worldwide standards of facilitation may rise to the best possible practice. Chad has been very active in the 5-MEO DMT scene over the years as both a facilitator and a member of the global 5-MEO DMT community, especially, as mentioned above, helping support communities in supporting themselves towards integrity and best practices. Specifically, um, he's on the show to talk about sort of like the those larger issues that any community will face um, in the modern world, but especially communities that are so interrelated and orienting around such profound yet vulnerable um, states of being. Um, and yeah, sort of unpacking some of the larger issues that are present in the 5-MEO DMT culture. He's also on the show to talk specifically about a group called the Conclave. The Conclave is an anonymous collective of dedicated, caring, conscientious, and compassionate practitioners who offer the sacrament of 5-MEO DMT in a safe, sacred, and responsible manner. And the Conclave has been working with larger groups of five facilitators over the years to develop some guidelines, which they, uh, the three sets of guidelines that they have available are best practices, integration guidelines, and a code of ethics. So... Chad was going to be anonymous. We weren't sure. There's a little reference to that. Um, but ultimately decided that he was willing and interested and excited about putting his uh, public face behind this discussion because he felt like it was very valuable. So much respect to you, Chad, for doing that. Um, and I'm sure all of us listeners here are going to appreciate that along with the content that you offer. So without further ado... Here is my interview with Chad Charles on Adventures Through the Mind. Enjoy. Well, let's get into it then, because now I've had this moment. I think I'm ready to go. How are you feeling? I feel well. I feel ready. Okay, great. Well, welcome to the show. Uh, and let's start with maybe the most entry-level general question I could ask you, uh, one that has been asked in many other podcasts and many of my listeners might already have a sense of but given the direction the conversation is going to go today probably good to start there what is 5-MEO DMT <laughs> 5-MEO DMT is a often called uh, the god molecule and I suppose it is called that uh, because it can be imagined as perhaps that bridge or seed or seat of consciousness, source consciousness that is embedded uh, as the Godhead in the human body. Um, it is a uh, dimethyltryptamine, a apparently and supposedly internal or endogenous to the human body. And when take, taken as a, kind of an exogenous or external boost uh, by its very function diminishes the activity of the default mode network, the, the part of that network that has to do with identity. And so the, the, the personality, the identity, the I uh, is in its fullest expression um, shut off which then reveals uh, quite efficiently and 
rather immediately uh, a direct experience with all experience that lies underneath the cloak or the veil of being human. Hmm. So I, I kind of want to, I want to poke in a little bit there. I, I don't know about the, if there's research on the, on the, um, on the, the, the pharmacology uh, or the neurobiological responses to 5-MeO DMT. Is that something that we know that, you know, for sure that it shuts down the default mode network or are you sort of, we'll say intelligently conferring that or uh, assuming that that's the case, given that the, you know, the psilocybin research. So shows that the reduction of this area called the default mode network is directly correlated with the experience, like the subjective experience of ego dissolution and so on and so forth that you're sort of inferring. Well, if that's the case, then almost definitely we can sort of like backtrack and say, well, if the experience is, total disintegration of ego self, then it's probably the same actions at play. Like is that, or, or is the research that I'm not aware of? I'm definitely and hopefully intelligently conferring towards this. There are little bits of research. I'm not an academic and I don't necessarily collect these things in any coherent manner. Uh, but hope to deliver them in my own language and in my own way in a somewhat coherent fashion. Um, yeah, I'll put it there. Okay, cool. So then why don't we get a sense of, um, like I'll, I'll have a bio read for you at some point during the intro that I do, mm -hmm. you know, during post-production. Um, but maybe we can get a sense for the listeners what it is that you do do. Um, you're sort of like, what is your state, your function and role um, in, in the, in the five scene. Sure. Um, well, I'm, um, a practitioner of, uh, five MEO DMT in a, pardon me, am I back? <laughs> That's funny. In a, uh, uh, in a therapeutic context to uh, call it a, um, a five assisted self-study or psychotherapy. Uh, and beyond my own private practice, uh, I've been involved on the international scene by different ways of um, co-founding 5Hive or 5MEODMT.org, which is an online secure forum uh, dedicated to all subjects related to the molecule, as well as having moderated for some years uh, the largest online presence that's dedicated to Bufuel Various or 5-MEO uh, on Facebook called Toad and 5-MEO Forum and Support, and uh, have been involved in um, uh, uh, an anonymous collective uh, called The Conclave uh, that uh, has been sharing over the last years um, rather, I think, to use the word again, coherent uh, documentation that I think all uh, practitioners of any denomination and any orientation can feel that there's there's a sense of uh, responsible, integral, and um, excellent uh, parameters there that they can they can fit into, and I lead gatherings of practitioners, um, uh, practitioners who are new uh, or thinking about becoming a practitioner um, or ones that are just starting, uh, as well as uh, regional gatherings of practitioners. So um, those geographical locations where there seems to be a critical mass at least or a, a high concentration of practitioners in one zone. And I uh, bring those practitioners together if they so choose together. Hmm, cool. Um, I'm, I'm noticing that I'm, I'm very aware. I'm very aware of your uh, urban urban landscape currently. Uh, and also, okay, so let's let's leave that behind. Listeners know that I, I touched on it. They heard it. You heard it. I heard it. We're going to do our best to stay focused. Um, so before I get into the conclave and sort of the role that the conclave is kind of playing in the in the larger, you know, 5-MEO DMT cultural scene, 
Um, maybe I can get a sense, again, going back to the one of these common questions, uh, the difference between 5-MeO-DMT and what's often called BUFO, because um, there is a difference, and uh, maybe you can just talk about that a little bit. Sure. Um, yeah, where, where can I start? I, I mean, basically, I like to start uh, answering that question, which is a very common one, in that um, if there was no... 5-MeO-DMT in the secretion of the Sonoran Desert Toad, nobody would be smoking it. And so 5-MeO-DMT is this essence that exists in a high concentration in the bufo. And so there's an essential, not only an essential component, but there's a certain function and reason why we smoke bufo alvarius, and it's the same reason or function uh, that is offered by the synthetic or isolated molecule 5-MeO-DMT. Experientially, once the fullest expression or the complete and absolute uh, diminishment of the default mode network or the sense of I, it doesn't really matter, in my opinion, how you got there. All of how you got there are just fingers pointing towards the moon. And it's really the experience itself, um, I think, I'd like to think, is why we, why anybody would ingest this and put this into their body. So on an experiential level, at the fullest expression, um, I don't see a difference. Um, in and around the entourage, perhaps, of getting to that full um, release, as it's often called, I would say that there's a slight experiential difference that can be sensed or noticed, and I would call that the spirit of the toad, and perhaps it's the, the bouquet effect of all of the different components that are in that organic substance i don't know very quickly a visualization that i use is if i imagine this skyscraper we're in an elevator we press the five button or we press the toad button and we're directing that elevator to go to the top of the building that's what it's designed to do it goes to the penthouse and beyond both the five and the toad button that's where they go, that's where it's designed to go, that's its function. With the pure molecule, the elevator shaft is precise, completely straight. With the Bufo Alvarius, perhaps the elevator shaft has a slight wobble to it. Hmm. Okay, awesome. Um, and additionally, one is a likely a synthetic chemical and the other one is derived from the organic source of a of the sonaran desert bufo alvarius toad uh, as well so let's get into the conclave then because i mean now that we got that now that we got that important foundations underway and i really liked uh the metaphor you had there um why don't you tell me a little bit about what the conclave is and what they are trying to achieve mm. Well, I'll put out there that uh, I am by no means uh, charged with uh, sharing with anybody about the intention of the conclave. The conclave is based on a, a gathering of conscientious 5-MeO, TMT, and Bufo Alvarius guides who decided to come together, to just come together because beforehand there were all these different practitioners and different lineages and uh, doing their own different thing which is fine and yet there didn't seem to be a lot of learning from one another there seemed to be maybe just separateness and so by just coming together and seeing what what's in it what's what's in that to come into a state of togetherness uh, and the core idea or reason behind that is that we're all in service to this one very particular molecule medicine tool whatever you want to call it um, 
has, in my experience, it results in this state, the state of communitas, the state of um, breaking down the walls of separation, learning from one another as opposed to um, uh, feeling that there's something going on here that I don't like or I'm going to be judged for what I do because there is no order. Uh, there is no tradition. There is no training or lineage. And so it's this non-denominational, um, I look at it as like the hub of a wheel that all spokes can fit into if they so choose. And with enough spokes, a wheel is created. And so it respects and invites diversity and after a while once that diversity started to settle in and we're learning about oh there's all these different ways that this medicine is being shared with people what are some of the best ways what is an excellent way and seeing the common denominators amongst the or within the field of different practitioners with varying levels of experience, whether it's and whether it's five MEO or Bufuel Various, um, seeing and recognizing that there are best practices. There's worse practices. There's better practices. There's there's best practices. There's something that we can recognize here. Oh. Well, we're recognizing this. Okay, well, that's beautiful. Has anybody else recognized this? No, I don't think so. Well, why not share this? And I think that's the spirit or the impulse that has given birth to um, the various documentation that the, the, this anonymous collective has just offered. Just here, here's, here's what we found. Maybe it's valuable to you. Um, as a participant, as a practitioner. Hmm. Interesting. So uh, there's, there's a couple of statements there that, that I thought were interesting and maybe, maybe, you know, deserve a little bit of unpacking. You said there's, there's no tradition, there's no lineage. I mean, it, it has been presented um, and I'll, I'll bring this up afterwards and the straw is very clangy. So heads up. Um, I'll bring this up afterwards a little bit more detail, but it was proposed and sort of brought about in the, in the cultural worldview of, of psychedelics that this bufo smoking was like an ancient Mexican something or other. Um, but recent evidence essentially supports that we are the first generation of people to be smoking bufo and that there is no ancient traditions. And so what I'm understanding here is that either in, you know, misinformed on this, the so-called fact of, of tradition or so on and so forth. You just have the sort of the emergence of all these people around the world, smoking it, sharing it with others, developing practices, maybe with or without the sense that they are connected to a lineage or no lineage at all, learning from each other, but not really cross-pollinating with each other. So creating these little sort of ideological pockets with their own sets of practices and beliefs and people associated to the conclave have recognized that in this happening, there's a lot of possible richness for learning um, and for developing safety protocols that help protect people from both the harm of, of um, we'll say, poorly delivered 5-MeO DMT, but also the harm of these sort of ideologically isolated, socially isolated cultural pockets, wherein um, it's easy to have uh you know the phenomenon of abuses of power and um and, and a variety of different abuses that might come into the scene so the conclave is sort of arising to say like let's let's come all together and look at everything and, and develop sort of a protocol um to offer out there or a, a, i i read a bunch of the the material this morning which i thought was interesting you know um you know documents for uh participants, how to prepare yourself, what you should expect from practitioners, and then several things for practitioners about, you know, here's what we consider to be best practices and, and here's integration tips and so on and so forth. And I thought that was all very interesting. Um, why, I mean, uh, let me think about this for a second. 
Does yeah. that all does that all fit? Does that does that sound like a good approximation of what's happening? Yeah, that all fits. Um, I mean, there's a couple of things that I'd like to perhaps add or tweak if, yeah, if that's yeah, welcome. Yeah, go for it. Yeah, go for it. So, yeah, when I say that, it sounds like very factual uh, about no lineage. Um, in terms of Bufo Alvarius, there's no continuous traditional usage that we know of. Maybe it was used in perhaps pre-contact times in um, uh, what's, you know, now Mexico and the United States. Um, but really, we know of Bufo Alvarius more and more because of what I call the Mexican wave, and that you, has been initiated by two very prominent practitioners that use the internet to share that this is what they're doing, this is what they're offering, and that created a sort of um, explosion, or at least increased the awareness of, of that this exists. But it had been used for some time. And when I, you said something about isolated pockets that um, uh, might result in abuses of power, or et cetera, et cetera. There, there had, and we're not the first generation hmm. really to be using this. Um, I think that this has been used, and if we want to uh, go into, say, Ralph Metzner's book, The Toad and the Jaguar, sure. this has been used for some decades now. And within some decades, there are some isolated pockets of usage that have created, let's call it maybe therapeutic practices or ceremonial formats that we could almost call a lineage, even though it's, you know, at the length of decades right now um so i just wanted to to put that into a, a context that there is a, a lone wolf syndrome that's out there of people who have access to this and they start sharing it and that doesn't guarantee that there's any kind of abuse going on mm -hmm. um, we do have small pockets of lineages um, that have been under the radar for quite some time well before the Mexican wave that started in what, 2010, 2011. And now that the cat is out of the proverbial bag, I think that the conclave, even though I don't think it was ever the intention, the conclave is a natural response to um, uh, wanting to, in my own words, extract the gold of what has been done in all of this short time in the last decades. How can we take what has been learned since the Mexican wave, before the Mexican wave, and come up with something that is coherent? <laughs> For some reason, that word's really coming up today. Um, and, uh, and salient and, uh, and beautiful, I'd like to think, uh, that most, like I said before, most practitioners can probably see themselves in like yes i this i can offer a level of service like this hmm. yeah i appreciate you reminding me about the toad and the jaguar i have read that book and somehow i just forgot about it when i was trying to approximate what you're saying um so what are some of the what are some of the general best practices that uh, the conclave is presenting out hmm. well it's a to some degree, there's there's really nothing new from what we've learned in psychedelic therapy that was developed in the 1950s. Um, the stages of uh, the conclave uh, recognizes it as um, a preparation, initiation, and integration. So three basic stages of an offering in whatever format or orientation that is being used. And I think most practitioners can see and even if they haven't thought about it, that in some way they prepare. In some way, their setup of initiation, the actual experience, is of a certain flavor and color. And in some way, they um, there's an integration process and procedure, regardless of how involved the practitioner is with that, with their participants. And then there's a, a premise or the principles of uh, creating a safe solid, secure, and sacred container um, for 
uh, the, the participant, whether that's one-on-one -on -one or with a group. And the, the best practices are really based on that. And uh, then also the conclave's code of ethics um, uh, goes forth and all the different, I guess you would call them protocols of um, how a practitioner uh, may care for an individual. What are the qualities of, of care and the boundaries of care? Uh, and then the mission statement that the conclave has is really about what is the spirit of this offering? Why are we offering this? What is this experience? And um, how uh, does a practitioner see themselves uh, as a bearer of this medicine? Hmm. Interesting. Um, I want to get into integration afterwards because there's a couple of things there that I thought were quite interesting. Um, but one of the documents you just sent me a couple of days ago seemed to be outlining a, an invitation. I'm not sure if this is directly from the conclave or not, um, but an invitation for local groups to self-organize into pockets and then to align themselves under sort of a larger umbrella um, that is uh, in you know, inspired by or connected to these code of ethics and best practices and stuff. Can you talk to me a little bit about what what is what that is, um, why and and how it's going? Sure. So yeah, that was a proposal that I sent you. It's um, what I've spoken about a couple of times with um, the Breaking Convention Psychedelic Leadership Summit, uh, the latest, the last um, World UFO. Uh, Alvarius Congress in Mexico City. It's a proposal with a, a larger idea or vision of how we might come to, uh, when I say we, this the world or domain of, of Bufo or five uh, practice and practitioners, how we might eventually come to uh, offer a response to conflict that might arise, grievances maybe that might arise. Uh, I listened to one of your latest uh, podcasts about uh, an incident perhaps involving Bufo Alvarius where somebody took their own lives, mm -hmm. uh, took, their own, took their own life, yeah, Tobias. Yeah. And this isn't, unfortunately, this isn't an isolated incident. There's, and, and it's natural and normal, I think, that there are incidents of, of various nature. Um, and yet in the world of five and Bufo Alvarius, there is no mechanism in how a potential hypothetical community of or association of practitioners might be able to assist in times of grievance or conflict. And what I'm proposing is that starts from the bottom up, that starts at the grassroots. And so what has been happening um, as of early 2019 are these gatherings of practitioners within a certain geographic region. And so the invitation is sent out for the practitioners to come together. Many do, many don't. I would say perhaps uh, in some cases, most don't, most decide not to come. And the idea, I would say that the gatherings are conclave inspired. It's not a conclave project. The conclave doesn't really have like, I, I don't know, ambitious ideas of like how to be involved in, 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 in the, the world scene of, of facilitation or what have you. Um, but these gatherings are inspired by what the conclave has represented, what it has accomplished, and uh, what it evokes uh, within a practitioner to, to be in the conclave. And the idea there is for these regional gatherings, if they so choose, to self formalize to self uh, organize into a perhaps a more formal organization um, to be uh, to have their own little wheel their hub that brings in the different practitioners from their city their country their region what have you and perhaps one day eventually given that there's enough of these regional organizations that perhaps there's more of an umbrella association that could create, formulate, and provide um, a 
mechanism of restorative justice for when there are, like I said, grievances or, or, or conflict re uh, resolution where mediation is necessary so that maybe one day um, open letters to notorious facilitators is no longer necessary. That maybe to, for the five and toad world to mature a little bit, to grow up, that maybe one day uh, a Facebook group like Beware the Bufo Gangsters is a thing of the past. That mm. there's something a little more um, yeah, mature that is there in service and advocates for the, the participants, the people that come into this experience. Hmm. See, there's there's a lot to unpack there, and your your final comments I want to get I want to get into afterwards. Um, so sure. let's see if I can ask them all in some sort of structured flow. My working memory is not super strong today. Uh, first off, you you had made a comment about Tobias. You said perhaps involving Bufo. It was most definitely involving Bufo. Um, Fair enough. The yeah. degree you to would which know better than me. Yeah, the the degree to which and like the specific instances described are are still sort of like hearsay, although there was a lot of direct people involved saying, this is what's happening. Um, and I'm thinking about, you know, the, the positive movement of these sort of like self-organizing groups, um, possibly, you know, directly associated to or inspired by these conclave best practices, having a, a, a positive impact eventually where an association with that type of group and those publicly available practices legitimizes practitioners and creates a framework for participants and future participants to know how to orient and navigate in the scene towards safe and and po ultimately positive experiences um, and connecting that to tobias and your comment that a lot of practitioners don't come is it was also reported that he was being facilitated by groups of people who reinforce his multiple big doses a day, seven times a day, apparently someone reported multiple days in a row where he was being provided the samples and or like the molecule. And he was also being provided the, yes, this is good. We'll hold the space for you. Um, and the sort of, I'd say like what I consider to be dangerous, um, spiritual bypassing and even de delusional levels of, uh, of, of sort of like spiritual concepts around the value or the importance of, of, uh, or, or what the five is offering with these big experiences. Um, and one of the other things too that I found, which is interesting is it, it seems like, I mean, there's a lot of big egos in the psychedelic scene, which is pretty funny. Um, but this seems like some of the most outspoken egos tend to be five MEO DMT people. And I think about James Orock um, and his sense that like uh, the ego is like a muscle and it gets stronger every time you break it down and that, the five MEO makes ego super strong because it breaks it down so much. And I'm curious, um, in, in particular, what you're seeing on a, on a cultural level being so involved across so many other, so many chapters around the world of, of five people, um, insofar as the role sort of ego is playing in the arrival of this conclave movement. Um, I mean, one immediate consideration might be you know, like, you don't tell us how to use our medicine kind of thing. Um, what, what have you seen in all of that, as well as any comments um, you want to add to what I just said? Sure. Thank you. <sighs> yeah, I was just feeling a little bit um, uh, talking about Tobias, and uh, there's other people in the world that have also had uh, incidents and deaths the past with uh, related to Bufo and Five, um, and also you know recently too, and so that really just you talking about it really brought me back there emotionally. Mm -hmm. um, what I experience when when I uh, I'm often involved in uh, with that premise of radical inclusivity. I'm often involved in inviting. Uh, practitioners that I either know or I hear about or other practitioners tell me about and and I invite them hey there's a gathering here come and and join us and I would say on average I would say more than 50 percent of um, practitioners say no usually the reasons are um, 
um, I'm, I'm busy working. Uh, you know, I, I you know, uh, I, I'm, I'm too busy offering this uh, to actually check in uh, with my own practice and, and be amongst peers. Um, oftentimes, I don't even get a response. Um, online, uh, this interpretation that gathering or or even the conclave as a gathering that is positioning itself as some sort of authority, as if it's saying, um, we know how this medicine should be offered to other people. And by bringing you into this means that you're going to be under this, this cloak of influence, uh, and you'll be in training to this authoritative figure of, of superiority. And uh, that's almost always the instant response there are some practitioners that are just like yes oh thank goodness yes of course i want to come i want to learn more i want to share this i want to be with other practitioners and yet most are no hell no i don't want to sit there and be judged by people who think that they're better than me and i don't want to be told what to do because you know what i'm good i know what i'm doing um the medicine tells me how to do what to do and that's it why would I show up for that? Mm -hmm. And there's so, that, there's that ego, right? Like there's that, or pardon me, I didn't mean yeah. to interrupt you. Please continue. No, no, that's, it's um, maybe, you know, maybe there's a link to what you're talking about that, that the ego, I would call it an enhancement. I don't know if that's a part of why practitioners decide uh, not to come together, uh, but I totally agree with um, James or uh, and others uh, in the suggestion that, yeah, if you're doing this so often and you are basically annihilating your ego, and guess what? The ego comes back. It always comes back. Everybody always comes back. And so it gets stronger as we're exercising those, you know, it's, it's, it rebounds and realizes it's invincible. It just comes back. <laughs> it dies and it comes back. It dies and it comes back. It's invincible. And yeah, perhaps that um, uh, that becomes a part of um, the egoic structure for that individual. So mm -hmm. I think that's totally possible in what I experience when people uh, decide to uh, not come and gather. Not that they're obliged, but when I think of these gatherings, I'm thinking like there's nothing else like it. Like we're offering such an enormous experience for people. Most people in these kinds of professions are having some sort of association with mentors, with peers, um, learning from each other. And yet there's this element of the bufo shaman or the 5-MEO DMT practitioner that is just doing it on their own and hopefully learning and advancing and not just relying on the participants to be their guinea pigs. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There's, there's something that you said there that I find interesting. And I, I've been thinking about this is that there's, there's a lot of times where I hear people talk about their five MEO DMT experiences as profoundly healing, very positive. Um, and, and wrapped up in sort of in, in their narrativizing, of that subjective healing comes something along the lines of everything is already perfect. I'm already love, you know, mm. and I, perf I think this is a profoundly important and positive revelation for somebody. And also at the same time, if that's the foundational basis for how you then move through the world afterwards, well, there's no reason to check in with yourself to self appraise, to get better, you know, to do the, I, I think about this, these, I think they're called the four dimensions or quadrants of, of spiritual practice that I heard Douglas Tatarin break down and it's reference to Ken Wilber. So there's, there's multiple levels of second hand here for me to like construct this, but I find it very interesting, which is it's the waking up, which is what seems to be the, what the five MEO DMT offers that full wake up to like the nature of I am being that I am right. Um, and then after that, there's the cleaning up which means you have to go in 
and start sorting out your actually sorting out your trauma now that you understand the nature of your reality is infinite love or whatever now go back in and start sorting out some of this trauma stuff and then the next one to be growing up and then to mature around all of that and then the final part being showing up which is to then now show up to the world awake clean and grown and adult Mm. to the times that we're in and the troubles that we're in um, as a as a member of something larger than our my own personal growth uh you know agenda so what i what i wonder about is how much the subjective experience of all is perfect is reinforcing types of ego structures um behavioral tendencies and even sort of cultural assumptions inside of these these pockets that there's n- there's no need to get better because the molecule like the bufo already teaches me perfection and i i as a holder of the bufo and a deliverer of it am an embodiment and an extension of that perfection into another person's reality or or whatever mm. it might be H- how do you feel about that mm. well what what came up for me right away was what i have come to experience in these um, gatherings of practitioners and they're so intimate uh, much unlike you know going to the the world booth while various congress where there's hundreds of people and we sit there and we listen to you know the sage on the stage talking at us um, the gatherings are in the way of circle and so very intimately we become well we're very vulnerable. Each practitioner is there sharing and exposing, and there's nowhere to hide in the circle. There's the equal and equanimous voice. And so that's where we entrain with one another, not because there's this authority, but we come to be in relation with each other we sort out those levels, we clean up perhaps our, the relational component of being human. And what I experience is a, a maturing process in the structure of these very intimate gatherings. Um, and so I think you were talking about, you know, stages within an individual. And I'm also thinking of like the stages of a movement or the stages of a certain domain or field of service with this particular molecule. And I'd like to think that these gatherings that are happening are a part of the cleaning up and moving towards um, the maturing. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, and to be clear, they weren't stages because they're not like progressive, but oh, they are like okay. uh, sort of dimensions. Quadrants, uh, you said, yeah. 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 Uh, so, and what I would also see is something like the, you know, at least at, at the very least, the intention of the conclave seems to be about that showing up. Okay, there's a, there's a, there's a need for something and it's our responsibility as awake, mature, intel- like uh, caring, informed people um, a part of a larger scene to show up to that need and do our best to address it um, on for the behen- for the benefit of of all peoples and all parties involved. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, I think that's all pretty interesting stuff. It, do you have anything else you want to comment? I'm going to move on to the next question. Hmm. I guess I'd like to very quickly just say that if there are practitioners listening to this right now of 5-MeO-DMT or Bufuel Various, and if an invitation comes to you to gather with your peers, there's, you are welcome as you are. There is no desire to create some sort of homogeneity or standardization or uniformity other than bringing your own practice and how you do things to a state of excellence. And who will judge that? Simply your peers, not as a single authority figure, but people just like you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very cool. Thanks. I mean, having, having read the guidelines, you know, the immediate assumption would be like, oh, what is this? western 
psychotherapeutic ethnocentric uh authority garbage but then when you read it it's it's very universal it seems very universal i mean it's it's in a fairly standardized sort of secular language ish um with references to ultimate love and source and blah 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 so almost almost secular <laughs> but it was it, it's very it's very universalized it, it seems like very inclusive of like here's the basic thing and also here's it's possible that there's a vast multitude of ways this might express you know for example ceremonial right. context as understanding context is important um, understanding that yeah. participate the the facilitator um, is a is a contributor a, a vital or a profound contributor to how that context is set um, and stuff like this so it, it seems it seems pretty universalized as far as me as someone who is a not had <clears throat> excuse me not had 5 meo dmt um and b am not participating in 5 meo dmt facilitator culture you know mm -hmm. i'm a quasi journalist i'm paying attention but from my my perspective which is you know just on the outside looking in it appears to be pretty universal so i, I maybe for the practitioners who are hearing you welcome that are still iffy to just read what's there and just like to read it and see that yeah. it's it seems very inclusive it that's funny that you say that because a lot of times i hear uh, i i ask some practitioners i mean how do you see yourself fitting into the, the best practices and many of them are like oh God, i i never read that i mean who i that's 16 pages long like i can't read that i'm mm. just like 16 pages of perhaps the most important document that has been offered in this culture of facilitation and you make your living off of this and take care of your family and pay your bills in doing this work and 16 pages is too much for you. I think to myself, wow, um, here is where um, we can come together to kind of up the game. I th see, I, I hear that. And even throughout this, I think about how such a response is, and I'm, I'm saying this in like, in a very neutral way, seems to be um, an expression of, of unaddressed, unseen, unaddressed um, insecurities. And I can go back to my comment about the everything is perfect the narrative or, or experience it seems to come up with five as someone who hasn't taken it, you know, like caveat there um, and unaddressed insecurities informing a person's ability to be like, Oh, I can't read this. Maybe there's an insecurity around lots of different factors that might say like, that's just blocking them. And the ego is saying it's cause I don't have time, but it's actually protecting that person from acknowledging that maybe they feel insecure about about a variety of different things in their life that is currently unaddressed because maybe they're a little too latched on to everything is already perfect, which is true in a non-dual state of awareness. But the reality of human life is that we're not actually living in like per per perfect divine, whatever oneness. We're also like humans and we're shitting and farting and like not making it to the bathroom on time. And <laughs> being too the flipping the bird on the road because you haven't eaten in a few hours and it's fucking traffic is crazy you know like <clears throat> all of these things are also you know all of these things are also included <laughs> um so okay next next question okay i i'm loving this idea like this like allowing um local communities to form and self-organize um I think there's a lot of autonomy there and the value of being in a sort of a peer support structure and a peer appraisal structure based in, you know, restorative circling um, rather than call out and cancel culture, I think is, I think is really positive. And also at the same time, we're talking about the administration of psychedelic drugs to people, which is on varying degrees of legality for 5-MeO-DMT across different countries. But ultimately, even if it's legal, as far as law enforcement is concerned, these are dangerous, suspicious groups that if they're not 
actively doing something illegal, such as facilitating a controlled substance, they are 100% most definitely connected into a scene of illegal activity. That's it's it's just undeniable. If you are a, a facilitator of a not illegal substance, such as 5-MeO-DNT, 100% you know people. You know the people that law enforcement wants to, you know, connect to. And one of the great strategies of law enforcement is to catch small fish or whatever on trumped up charges, pardon the phrase, um, and and then utilize them to like basically utilize that as an advantage to try to take down larger people. So simply knowing each other, okay, outside of a law enforcement scenario, this is beautiful. It's important. It's like, wow, incredible. Now situate that inside of the, the I'm just going to go for it, the fucking draconian, broken, backwards, prohibitionist bullshit that we live in okay and then all of a sudden coming together becomes a danger so what is what is what is the conclave's general uh or what is the people associated with the conclave what is the general tone around security yeah um well the conclave uh, right in its initial mission statement identifies itself as a anonymous collective, um, which basically means uh, that uh, I think it's kind of like, I can't remember the, the rules of fight club, uh, something similar like that. You, you don't, um, you don't speak of uh, other people. You don't identify who is part of the collective. So then how, how do you sustain that anonymity when you are a group of local practitioners? So how mm. and and I'm I'm, you know obviously I'm looking for practical stuff here. Okay, so the conclave yeah. the conclave is staying anonymous. The philosophy behind that makes complete total sense to me. Um, now, but what what are the practicalities of these of these of these self organizing groups? Are are there specific techniques or perspectives or technologies that are or should be employed in order to maintain the security? Hmm. I don't I don't know. I really think that it's up to that locality. Uh, when I think of um, one of the more advanced self organizing groups or gatherings or now organizations that's happened in Mexico City, it's the um, Bufo Alvarius Therapists Association. Um, because of the nature of things in Mexico, whether that's legal or cultural, or you can get away with anything, they're very open about that. They have a website. It's incredibly transparent because they can, uh, and they feel confident that there's that that's okay. Um, if that were to happen in a, a state, a country where that is illegal, uh, I don't know. I guess it would have to be continue to be underground. Um, and anonymous and then the question is well is that effective does it have an impact on that local community is it reaching anybody does it make a difference and I'd like to say that those those the first impulse I would hope that a practitioner has in coming together is not to have this top-down idea of how to run and regulate and control uh, the world of five or psychedelics and how things operate, but more to come into um, alignment with their cohort first and foremost, coming there and, and doing that um, rather anonymously. The, these gatherings are not promoted or advertised around. They're sent word of mouth to those that we know how to reach them. And, um, and, and so initially, the gatherings are anonymous and under the radar, so to speak. How they choose to self-organize is really up to them. Hmm. That's all I can say about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's interesting. Uh, I also think about how, you know, a chain is only as strong as its weakest link. Mm -hmm. um, and also a colleague of mine who you may know, Benjamin Mudge, 
at the Psychedelic Leadership Summit, um, he spoke of the value and importance of people essentially using secure technologies. Um, mm -hmm. and, and by secure technologies, he means specifically signal or wire uh, in order to do these conversations. Because, And I can't remember exactly what terrorist attack thing it was, but recently there was a report of, uh, of this group that got away with some attack uh, and they communicated exclusively on regular cell phones, regular SMS with explicit language, and they still weren't found. So, mm. I mean, there's a larger consideration as to what their surveillance is actually for um, and how far they're willing to go. But the reality is, is that as long as you're using insecure technologies, you're adding into a database that at some point in time, they're not, they're not deleting that data. You know, at some point in time, that data will become, um, will become relevant if, say, um, crises uh, precipitates a greater access to public information on behalf of law enforcement without warrant um, or changes the priorities of law enforcement um, towards greater levels of totalitarian control, which something like, I don't know, no food in the grocery stores due to ecological crisis might 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 push us to situations like that so things to consider for the listener you know and and possibly for the practitioners listening now i mean emails about the the quote meditation retreat you know might be serving mm. some sense but you know there's no you know it's not it's not like federal law enforcement doesn't know what quote the mother is or quote toad medicine is a is a is a euphemism or code like code language for it, right so something to think about there especially whatsapp just putting that out there whatsapp is not a secure place for conversations um and if you are a listener i'm just going to go on this soapbox thank you for letting me have this for a second okay if you are a listener yeah. and you buy substances from somebody even if they don't care although i'd be surprised if they don't please do not message them sms you know, like regular texts asking for substances. I'm, I'm going to, like, I don't have any and I don't provide any, but like the amount of times people just message me on Facebook asking me if I can get them mushrooms or like they found my name on Reddit and wondering if I know where to get LSD. Like, give your fucking head a shake first and foremost. Um, but for people out there, if you're lucky enough to have someone in your life who is taking the level of risk for their entire life, their entire life could go down the fucking tube and they're taking that risk to be a provider of high integrity, clean, reliable sources to sacred medicines or just recreational substances. Um, they, your, your the menial effort of just using a secure messaging technology is helping to honor the fact that they take that risk for you. Okay, there are straight up just fucking drug dealers out there that are making a buck. Fine. You know, maybe if you like your supply from them, try not to get them in trouble either. But I'm talking about, you know, what what might be called like the righteous dealer, the person who calls you a few days later to see how you did. Is everything all right? The kind of person who if you have a problem, you can go back and talk to them and they're there to support you. Essentially friends in your community or whatever it is. Mm. Listeners, just just keep it in mind. Um, OK, I'm off my soapbox. Thank you for giving me that opportunity. I liked it. Okay, so let's move into the next thing. Um, now, I heard you say this at the leadership summit in uh, in London, and uh, you mentioned it here. Essentially, a criticism against the way the I don't want to say the larger five community, although there was a lot of people internationally that got on board um, with the I think it was the five meo malpractice dot org. Um, and the open letter against Octavio Reddig and uh, Jerry Sandova. Um, I'm curious if you could just just outline your criticisms a little bit more of that process, and I think I have some more targeted questions once I get a sense of it. Sure. I, I don't necessarily have a criticism of that action that was taken or the anonymous collective that took all of that incredible effort uh, to make that happen. I think that at this in this quadrant perhaps that there is a um, collective cleaning up and 
I think that that open letter, for example, is a part of that. And I think it's, I don't know if it's a necessary component, but I think it's an understandable outcome uh, because I would see that that letter having its importance because there is nothing else. Mm -hmm. there, it's in a vacuum. There is no other platform or mechanism with which to advocate for participants, with which to deal with conflicts um, or to mediate amongst facilitators or um, between participants and the person they were in service with. And so in lieu of those platforms or mechanisms existing, something like an open letter that was very well done mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. is understandably going to happen. I'm just saying my criticism is of the, the, the culture at large is that at this, I don't know if it's a stage, but at this point, um, surely we can do better than that. Surely there's something um, that can be created that is, instead of being um, punitive or attacking, can be uh, restorative and healing. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if the open letter is necessarily healing or restorative, at least not to the potential that I've seen restorative justice circles amount to. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I, I have, I, I have my own, I have my personal sort of uh, criticisms of call out and cancel culture. I think it's immature and reactive um, and does not actually serve progressive social or cultural um, development whatsoever. Um, and at the same time, I recognize that it is it is where the culture is currently at, even the larger culture as a whole, like a, the world culture, entertainment culture, political culture, um, that call out and cancel is the only way that people seem to figure out how to deal with things. Um, I don't think it's it's definitely not the best we can do. And it's not even, I think, really working because it's it's something equivalent to like a, a social death sentence you know, without, without actually having a lot of the time without actually having a trial. Um, so, so I have some issues around that. And also I'm wondering if, as far as I understand, you know, both, both Jerry and Octavio were contacted by groups trying to get them to listen to sort of like criticisms of their practices and so on and so forth and did not respond. So even if there was you know, increasingly the sort of like localized chapters all sort of like sharing with each other and this peer appraisal and support and, and constructive culture and so on and so forth, you know, what is the appropriate way to deal with people who completely deny any involvement with anything like that whatsoever and continue to on mass scale um, facilitate what appear to be you know, dangerous behaviors and, uh, you know, har harming people, either mm -hmm. directly harming them or at the very least creating an atmosphere of potential harm, whether that person was harmed or not. Um, what are your thoughts on that? Well, my thoughts go t immediately to the difference between uh, policing and regulating and um, providing um, education and uh, restorative justice. So how far or how effective can education and restorative justice be? Um, and where does uh, policing um, or um, uh, what's the word I was looking for? Policing or uh, regulating. regulatory, yeah. regulating, um, uh, where's that necessary? Is it ever necessary? Is there anything that we can do? And to create that regulatory body and a police network, so to speak, um, would probably require some sort of uh, central authority figure. And what I've learned in gathering practitioners of 5-MeO-DMT and Fubufo alvarius is that most people will run very far away from any scent of anything that smells anything like authority. Mm 
So the chances of that happening, at least in the five and Bufo world, I don't see it. Um, restorative justice has, you know, that's an umbrella term that includes many different mechanisms and, and, uh, uh, and formats. Restorative justice circling, which creates a collective justice system where there are witnesses that the community is involved. It's not just mediation. Um, can happen without even the participation of, let's say, the antagonist. Hmm. Uh, and healing or conflict can be resolved um, even without that person's direct participation. And um, that takes a mechanism that is completely transparent, um, that obviously has the buy-in by at least a certain number of people, and um, what's talked about as an ombudsman or a facilitator who creates that environment. Um, and I'd like to think that it's possible. Hmm. I don't know if policing is possible. Hmm. That's interesting. Yeah, I've, I've actually been a part of circles now for a while. They're really beautiful thing. And I have been a part of a restorative. It wasn't so much restorative justice, um, although it there was some sense of violation present there. It was more like, sort of, it, I guess it was kind of restorative justice. It was it was a very interesting, powerful, beautiful thing to be a part of. Difficult at times um, mm -hmm. to be a witness and a and a uh, supportive person in the, in that process it was but it felt so much more valuable than just being like, well, fuck that person, get him out of here or whatever it is. Um, right. So I'm wondering to, this is a big question because it's like, of course, none of us, none of us in the world of psychedelic culture, I think, want to see our cohorts, whether we like them or not, um, taken down by the current institution like the current prohibitionist institution. But in your view, is there a, is there a point at which we, um, we should, I mean, should comes with a fundamental morality. So I'm aware of the, the shame and the, and the, and the, the um, essentialism that's behind the word. Yeah. But is there a point where it best serves the community at whole uh, to involve police? And what issues do you see present there? I have never been asked that before. And I really have no idea. Hmm. I don't know. <laughs> I have no idea. Hmm. Well, what a nice space to enter. Hey, <laughs> here we are. The liminal, the liminal space of unknowing. <laughs> Um, the I don't know. Yeah. 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 So yeah. maybe that's, maybe that's something for the listeners to start unpacking something to chat about on the Reddit. Um, all right. So let's, let's, let's take a, a turn. Let's go down this street here. I got in my mind um, and, and get in a little bit about integration. Okay. And specifically, I, I don't want to have a long conversation about what integration means and so on and so forth. But since I got you here and you're well-versed and you've seen and held the space for many people um, over the years, I want to talk about what in the the guidelines, um, the concave guidelines, they call reactivations. Mm. Yeah. You want me to discuss reactivations? Yeah. Yes, please. Well, I think that whatever I'm going to say is somehow an opinion of mine. I, I don't, I'm not a neuroscientist. I don't know exactly what's going on. Um, but I have formed my opinions. Yes. After having seen and witnessed uh, hundreds of experiences, um, which not everybody has reactivations. In my experience, I would say less than 50% of people actually have reactivations. I don't know if reactivations are due to uh, a quantity of the substance that's been taken um, or frequency of the substance that's been taken. I don't really know. I haven't noticed that myself. 
But I do have um, a framework in which I, oh, sorry, in which I look at uh, reactivations, and it's this is this is how I picture it. 5-MeO-DMT is apparently endogenous in the body. It's already there. It's a neurotransmitter, which I suppose means that it travels around um, the, the neuropathways of the body. And I'm imagining um, some beautiful Alex Gray painting of seeing all these networks of neuropathways. Cool. And I imagine when we ingest 5-MeO-DMT, which by the various means that you can do that, um, we're introducing a boost of what is already the body's already familiar with and perhaps that's why uh, it's not toxic or james orak talks about the levels of toxicity and how it's metabolized in the body extremely quickly apparently there's no residue you don't feel much residue except for that psycho emotional glow or the opposite of glow um, but it's it's gone i imagine Pac-Man just gobbling up all of those molecules until they're all gone. And yet there's this thing called reactivation. So uh, a lot of people maybe liken that to flashbacks or there must be still um, the, the residue or the remnants of the exogenous boost that was taken. And I'd like to think that that's actually not what's happening. It's not like there's still uh, an excess quantity of the molecule in your body. The way that I frame it is that we have these neuro pathways and by taking this boost we are flooding flushing this the, the the neuro pathways this system i almost think of a city's sewer system and a storm comes in and all of the rain falls and it gets channeled into the sewage system and it flushes it all out and so afterwards it's cleaned up there's there's no more crud there's no more residue sticking to the walls and so then the internal or endogenous molecule comes out to play after the storm. Like, whoa, what was that? Oh, the storm's over. Okay, let's go and see what happened. Wow, everything's cleaned up in here. This feels good. Yeah, there's this openness and there's this fluidity almost in the body on, on a psychic level that we, um, that we can experience again. And when is it experienced? Typically at night. Why at night? I would imagine because while we're sleeping, we are in the most surrendered position. We are at our most relaxed place. And really surrender, in my view, is the name of the game when it comes to this medicine. The fullest expression will arrive at either your greatest surrender or a incredible submission to typically a large dose, excessively large dose. But as we come into this surrendered position, we're sleeping, all the conditions are there, where our mind is relaxed, and we can come into this reactivation of what the experience was initially when we ingested this boost of the molecule. And so, to me, reactivations occur because there's an openness in our system. Is, that, is there any neuroscience background to anything that I'm saying? None. <laughs> I don't know how else to explain it, but over the years, and I talk to people about reactivations, when are they happening? Typically at night, okay. Um, are they happening again and again? Um, sometimes they are. Sometimes it's just once. Sometimes it's for months after. Sometimes it's for weeks. And like I said, for more than 50% of people, they're not experiencing reactivations. Um is it correlate with the amount that they had? I haven't noticed that because when I think of amount, um, I think, okay, the quantity of the substance can be measured, but the um, quantity of resistance or surrender in any one given person's body in that moment cannot be given a number. And so the impact of the experience is a combination of factors um, one being probably the greatest mystery of all that we'll never grasp or need to. 
the reactivations, I think, are nothing to be concerned about. I see them as a normal process. They can be disturbing. They're going to screw up your sleep at night, maybe for days on end. This is the ongoing process of awakening, I would argue. Hmm, interesting. So can you maybe characterize what a reactivation would feel like or seem like? Because what's running through my head, and I've, I've had this, I've had these experiences, um, and there have been times where, you know, my interpretation of them is wondering about it being a pathological state. Um, which I understand you uh, or in the guidelines, it sort of encourages not to pathologize these experiences. Um, and I can totally understand that um, when medical advice is needed, or like actual psychiatric intervention, that's maybe a different, much longer conversation. Um, but, uh, you know, for me, the experiences are sudden derealization or sudden depersonalization. Now, is that what you mean by reactivation or are we talking like all of a sudden my I'm just like I'm in peak source consciousness. I am peak source consciousness all of a sudden um, or like characterize it for me. Sure. Um, the reactivation itself can be very similar to the moment when somebody actually took in the 5-MeO-DMT. Um, personally, I've never experienced a full release in a reactivation, but I'd say I've come very close. What does that mean? That means that I am having the um, somatic and psychological effect of the 5-MeO-DMT spontaneously in my sleep and I'm kind of, you know, I've got one foot in and one foot out. I don't, there's, there is the I because I'm observing it. Um, but there's also this depersonalized aspect that is very strong and almost dissociative. Um, and it can, and then of course, when it's spontaneous and there's no plan, you don't know how long it's going on for. And that can be very destabilizing and concerning as the mind is wondering what the hell is going on. And as soon as it gets on that track and the resistance starts, well, then a reactivation can go from um, what many people consider a bonus into the realms of hell and darkness. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah, I'm wondering too about like uh, every time I go on on uh, theme park rides, um, roller coasters, which I haven't in a while because the last time I was on one, something shifted in my inner ear and it was the weirdest, most disorienting, sickening feeling. And I'd rather not ever have that happen again. Um, but th historically, I would get home that night and I'd lay down in bed and I wouldn't sleep because I was just on the roller coasters over and over again somatically for what I could tell is the rest of the evening as soon as I started falling asleep. Um, so I'm thinking about something along that lines as like a sort of approachable metaphor uh, or, uh, mm -hmm. you know, something akin to except instead of it being roller coasters, it's five, five MEO DMT. Like I know I'm not on the roller coaster. I'm lying in bed. And also I'm on the roller coaster. Um, yes. Interesting. So um I'm also wondering too, maybe about uh, just the role of somatic memory in general, maybe not involving the neurochemical at all, but the reliving of something somatically as the body digests it as it mm. would um, in the same way it would integrate a trauma memory, like acute trauma. I know that, and I think to some degree, yes, even if it's positive, it's a traumatic thing for the ego to go through um, to be completely obliterated, I imagine. Um, and in acute trauma, it's actually quite normal to show the symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder for something like three months after uh, a, a extreme experience. But that doesn't actually, that's not technically post-traumatic stress disorder. That is the appropriate process by which the memory is, cons like the memory system is consolidating the experience. Um, mm. So I think that there, for me, I'm seeing a link there too, although of course the association to trauma can be problematic if it's a very positive experience um, but i'm just seeing those correlations sure you want me to comment on that please <laughs> um is there a link there to reactivations or just to the experience with 5meo uh, at large i think i'm i i'm 
I'm just kind of commenting and ex and just talking out some ideas um, and just in the sense of wondering if it becomes relevant to any of the people listening or to yourself, as well as a way of like putting them out to you, getting feedback. You're much more experienced in this world than I am insofar as 5MEO specifically. So I'm just kind of throwing it out there and seeing, mm -hmm. uh, seeing what bounces back. Well, actually, what you said there, actually, what feels good for me to 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 riff on is actually yes, what would concern a, a potential or prospective participant coming into this experience, and that is to get an idea of what is the practitioner's orientation. Um, is it psychonautic, psycholytic, shamanic, neo shamanic? Um, therapeutic psychotherapeutic um, where are they coming from and if we are concerned about or interested in um, approaching this as something for uh, resolving um, trauma resolving unintegrated or repressed experiences then we might be more interested in somebody with a particular orientation that is trauma informed uh, on a level that makes sense to us um, and if we're not concerned with that, well, then somebody's orientation that doesn't really uh, include that lens or that framework might be not so interesting. And so I, I think that if, if we recognize that in ourselves that there's some unresolved trauma, um, it's important to ask a practitioner about what their skill set is around that, what their lens is around that, what is happening, so that we can judge for ourselves, is this the appropriate practitioner for me? Mm -hmm. And I think that's a large part of um, the Conclave's best practices, is empowering the prospective participant to decide themselves um, who is the best practitioner for them getting a better understanding, informing themselves what this experience can be, which is unpredictable in, 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 in my view. Hmm. Cool. Yeah. Thanks for that. Um, I think we're kind of rounding, rounding the corner here, uh, coming, coming back to uh, some, some sense of completion. Uh, but I want to, I want to finish with, um, you know, our, our whole conversation here has had a lot to do with, you know, this transparent community appraisal support structures, um, you know, betterment, betterment structures, and um, caring for the participant, of course, and best practices and all the rest. And one of the things that's also included um, in the conclave stuff, which I think is relevant to talk about, especially having brought up um, Tobias and the experiences that you have, um, you referenced there sort of non-specifically, uh, is caring for the guides and the level of the level of intensity that guides and practitioners go through in order to support people in these experiences. Maybe I don't know if I have a specific question because I don't entirely know your position on it, but maybe you could talk a little bit about you know why that's important, um, what it might look like, and and what has your experience been insofar as where it's where a lack of it has caused harm? Mm. Yeah. Well, I didn't expect that one. That's good. Um, mm. Yeah. Self care, um, taking care, making sure that we're taking care of ourselves, ourselves, anybody for that matter, but talking about, uh, facilitators, practitioners of, of Bufo and 5-MeO-DMT, I might work backward in that set of questions and where I see that there's potential harm. <clears throat> I've seen... Oftentimes I, I talk with uh, practitioners and I'll say, check in with them. How you, how you doing? What's going on for you? Oh, wow, I'm just working so hard here. I got 20 people today and, and uh, it went from nine in the morning to midnight and I'm just exhausted. But wow, there's all these things happening. It's just beautiful. People are having beautiful experiences. It's great. And I'm just like, yeah, when, when did you eat last? Hmm. Oh, I don't know. I, I, don't, I don't need to eat or, or whatever. You know? um, 
I, I have these conversations. I hear this a lot amongst practitioners. Like, wh where where are you in this picture? Like, there's almost this is it this selfless service or this this compulsion to 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 offer this experience at 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 your own expense in a sense. And sometimes I get a sense of compensation. You know, um, maybe a practitioner has come into this place where they found this incredibly potent and beautiful way to be in perhaps in their own opinion in service to the world by using this extraordinary tool, sacrament, medicine uh, to um, alleviate so much pain within us to elevate us to so much greater um, liberation and feelings of love um, that maybe there's a compensation for perhaps all the moments in our lives where we feel we we've been we haven't been worth much uh, that we haven't been um, living up to the potential of being a human and uplifting each other and sometimes i get a sense of um that uh, that facilitator that is just working non-stop and not really taking care of themselves as uh, something that is within themselves compensating for something else that i, I won't go further into mm -hmm. and the result being um that there's less presence that they can offer a participant and i think that when less presence is being offered a participant the facilitator is relying so much on the medicine itself and i don't mean to say that the experience is about the facilitator however as a steward of it and as a a, a bearer of it um, we have a role to create a set and setting around it um, that has enormous implications into um, the quality of the experience someone has. And the more run down a practitioner is, what I've seen is that the, the, the less, the container is less tight. And I won't go into the energetics of what that means necessarily, uh, but I think that there's some the quality of the offering suffers, and if the quality of the offer suffers, then the potential of the experience for the participant is diminished. Hmm. So uh, there's 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 something there I want to ask about, like how community helps to support that. But first, mm -hmm. I want to get into like what happens and what is and cuz cuz it does happen to bias being a good example um when the the when there's a there's a lack of self care um okay so there's sort of physical stuff eating sleeping taking a break having colleagues to talk to to be like you know what it's all love and beautiful and it's a blessing to offer this and this person fucking threw up all over me and it's like the fifth time today I got thrown up on and I'm frustrated and I had to stop them from hitting me in the face. You know, like the reality is like, we're also human, you know, so that can be agitating and in the role it's like good. But then afterwards it's like, it's okay to just vent some of that stuff off to a safe place and just like get some yeah. of it off your chest, even to give yourself a space to consciously rant and be angry and frustrated inside the container of recognizing like, well, I mean, I don't mean any of the things that I'm saying beyond them being utterances of me decompressing tension. Mm -hmm. And once that's done, I can come back into a normal state of consciousness. But for now, I just need to say, like, fucking son of a bitch hit me in the face, you know? Um, <laughs> and I hate being hit in the face. Uh, so outside of that type of self-care, I mean, I kind of answered the question about community support for you there. So please comment afterwards. What about when practitioners get lost in the in in the in the spiritual ideologies? What what about when the practitioner is not caring for themselves? Not in the sense of eating, sleeping, 
decompressing, but in the sense of repeated use, ongoingly mm -hmm. having more and more 5-MeO-DMT um, <clears throat> and possibly in the case of Tobias, building these weird spiritualized constructs um, that reinforce the continued use. At what point, would, I, I'd just like you to comment on that. Sure. Um, I'd like to comment on both, if, if I may. Sure, yeah, please. So you mentioned community support and and really what I've part of my my greatest fulfillment in being a part of collectives of practitioners in my field in my vocational field is um, peer support. Um, these gatherings are like a refuge. They're like a sanctuary mm. where there's I'm surrounded by people that know exactly what I'm talking about. They have the same experiences as me and I can relax into that. And I can also rely on them to say, you know what, Chad, you know, you're, you got your head up your ass, buddy. Um, <laughs> let's, yeah. let's check. Let's can, can we offer a reflection? Can we, let's check in with your ego. You're out there all by yourself in the world and you're doing your thing, but okay. Let's, let's reel it in. There's the, um, I would call the beauty and the magic of being amongst a cohort is huge. And it's been a huge part of my learning, uh, as a facilitator is being amongst uh, my peers. But the segue that you mentioned into perhaps the over usage, at least on a, uh, you know, you know, on one hand, there's the there's the psychonaut um, going and and taking it themselves. There's also the the repeat participant that keeps on going back to the facilitator, back to the facilitator. I like to look at that. Um, I have a little visualization or, or imagery that I use, and I like to think of that um, along the uh, what we're doing when we encounter, say, five meo DMT. And I'm just going to talk about that because that's what I know the most. Uh, but you can really fill in fill in the blanks with with other things. It's just there's a life force there, and and we are um, upholding uh, or maintaining the life force by doing beautiful work that say Bufo or Five MeO DMT offers us. And I picture that support line as uh, an electrical line outside, and that electrical line is supported by poles, and that pole might be represented as a regenerative experience, maybe a ceremony, maybe a session with 5-MeO-DMT. It, it brings up the energy, so to speak, as the power line uh, goes across it. And in between those poles, there's gravity, the weight of the world. And that line will sag in between those poles. And so it's in between those ceremonies, in between uh, those experiences that are very uplifting and regenerative, um, where we live 99% of our lives. And whatever we do in between those poles is the maintenance of that healthy, balanced, parallel to the ground, um, life work, life experience. And when I hear, you know, as you're commenting about somebody like Tobias taking 5-MeO-DMT again and again and again, what I see is that instead of just doing the work, so to speak, you know, the old adage of um, the chopping of the wood and the hauling of the water uh, before and after enlightenment, um, instead of doing that, well, why don't we just erect a pole right next to the other one? Hmm. And why don't we just erect a whole bunch of poles so that there is no sag and there is no need to do any work. We just keep on going back to the regenerative pole. And in that, I think that we can lose touch with reality, 3D life. Um, we lose touch with the art of living, um, which is in large part consists of that time and space in between those poles. And the art of living might involve um, other aspects of self-care, sorry, um, that involve, who knows, wh whatever your self-care practices are. 
And so when I consider what's happening with somebody like Tobias, I see like, wow, that I don't know how I would maintain sanity if I built so many poles right next to one another. And that's where the majority of my reality would be. Um, I, 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 I can't imagine that I've fortunately or whatever, I've never experienced that, but, um, that's how I, that's how I kind of frame that. Hmm. Does that make any sense? It does. It does make sense. Um, I mean, there's a couple of things are one of which, I mean, to be clear about people who haven't heard my episode about what happened to Tobias, <clears throat> we're talking about it pretty casually here, but it is, it is a really tragic thing that happened to, um, a, a beautiful, caring man. Um, and I want that perspective to be held, even though it might not be immediately assumed for people listening. Um, hmm. <clears throat> and there's a, I, I think there's a deep caring in, in like, I, I feel a deep caring in even talking about it for him and also to the larger cultural world, why, why we're talking about it at all. And I, I sense that in you too, especially your first response earlier in the episode, um, made it clear that there was a lot of caring there and caring because it wasn't just, it's not just Tobias. It's, that's been caught up in this, in, in this, We'll just say like this this repeated use trap that f f some people find themselves in with 5-MeO-DMT um, and that there was a, a whole community of people around him, some of which different communities, a small community reinforcing and making it worse. Um, mm -hmm. So um, and then the other thing, too, is is in a, in a conversation with a with a guy who uh, who I really respect and appreciate out in Vancouver, he was talking about ceremony. And I think I think he was maybe talking like referencing um uh oh shit who wrote iron john what's the you know that book um no. shit robert bly i see it on my shelf right there um that shit. that life like we're like clay and and as we go through life we're sort of like in the muck and um and life is sort of like packing the muck on and also sort of like forming us and when we go into ceremony what we end up doing is just like we're going into pack and then kiln like to pack and bake mm -hmm. and then we yeah. go back into the world and then we have to like go in shape and bake shape and bake um and if we don't go into ceremony at, at all then you know by by the time you know our age of majority comes up whatever that is and so far as our role in caring for the generations to follow and the the you know the culture and society that we are showing up to um then we're not going to be able to be a vessel to carry anything of any of any substantial value like we'll not be a good water vessel for example but if we stay in ceremony for too long and we don't come out cool down and pack in those other layers we become a cracked pot mm. and we can't bear water either um, but we might appear as though we could, um, we can't. So there's something there about like ceremony being very important. And I mean, maybe the dichotomy falls apart at some point, but the reference, I think it was Iliade, that entering into the profane is also important um, as well. So, <laughs> so I, I mean, I imagine you That's have a some beautiful image. I like that. Thank you. Yeah. I imagine you have something to say to that. Um, but to really close out, um, is there anything, I don't know what this question is, and, I, and, I, and I'm certain you're going to caveat it as, as not being an authority on this question, um, but you know, what can communities do um, when they see someone falling into that repeated use trap? Um, like what, I mean, obviously it'd be different to each different situation um, and each different person, but what are some general thoughts you have in the sense of like, how do we keep that person we care about safe? Um, and what are the degrees of response? Hmm. Wow. That's, that really touches me because I, I had uh, somebody dear to me who also uh, died in a Bufo related death. And in hindsight, <sighs> internally and, and with others in that person's world um, look back and, and saw, well, what, what, what could have I done? Mm -hmm. um, what, uh, what, 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 what could have 
benefited or prevented that, if you will. And, um, somehow, uh, not being scared to bring it up. I don't know how we come to that, but I, I saw in my own unconscious when I was looking back into the, I was like, for sure, I saw, I noticed things. I had question marks about some things that I was experiencing and seeing in this person. And yet I didn't go further with them. I didn't, it's like I wasn't listening or I, I had no one else to rebound to have a sounding board with and um and i'm not sure why that is they were there but i was reluctant i was reluctant to to come across as as being doubtful or mistrustful or um disrespectful or critical or skeptical and i I don't know why that was important to me uh, quite frankly but i know that I, there's a certain chagrin that I have in not having discussed this, the little things that I saw, not only with this person who eventually died, but with the people in his entourage, in our social circle. Um, and so I think that that would have resulted in perhaps an intervention. And then what does an intervention look like? Um, is it one-on-one? -on -one? Is it a uh, community base? Does it come from from community or a collective? I I don't know. Um, what I imagine, what I envision, uh, as a response to experiences like these, is a, a sort of perhaps like an anonymous umbrella body or association that that can be contacted. Um, that can be said there's there's this is happening um, I'm noticing this what can I do kind of like a, a hotline yeah, that can thinking. be responded to in an, in, an, in an anonymous fashion an anonymous and neutral fashion that has a systematic approach to responding to preemptive concerns or um, full-fledged conflicts etc th that there's an ombudsman that receives the call and has a, a system that can take action whether that be um, an intervention whether that be education and support for those around the person who's making this kind of anonymous call like I think this person is like this um, or having a, a, a full out um, so-called justice system that can come in not as an intervention, but as a collective healing platform. I envision that. Um, and that visioning comes from the stories such as Tobias, the, the other incidents that have happened in both North America and Europe in the last year. And um, I do care, and that's why I want to talk about this vision. Mm -hmm. um, there's a top-down idea that is the vision, but really the vision is from the bottom up, and it, it requires the practitioners to take responsibility, like you said earlier, to come on board. Let's have, let's have a bigger picture outlook here. What's going on? How can we be in service to not just my own practice and the people that I invite into it with best practices, et cetera, but how can I contribute to this very fast growing modality? And I really think that the simple gesture and act of coming together is where it starts thank you um now to to conclude i think that's a really great place to conclude it really it really comes full circle as well because i mean a apart from the sort of like somewhat st staccato uh first 20 minutes when we were just talking about 5meo dmt but then when we really got into stuff about you know what the vision of the conclave is and 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 what you're hoping to achieve um 
in the culture with your time in it. Uh, Can I correct you just for a second there? Please, yes. That is my personal vision. Okay, great. It's not the vision of the conclave. However, I would like to, I hope that the conclave would like to participate in a visioning like that, as I would hope all the different bodies in the 5-MEO Bufuel various world would like to participate as well, um, as this is a collective effort uh, that's not coming from one place. Hmm. Okay, thank you for clarifying, and thank you for using this hand gesture for clarification, because it's totally like a <laughs> It's totally like a we're getting clear, like straight cut straight down the middle right at you. Um, <laughs> okay, so um, great full circle. Nice to end. It's a heavy topic, so it's nice to end on a, on a little uh, levity and, and good heartedness here. Um, now, you and I discussed, we don't know if this is an anonymous interview yet. This is why I've not spoken your name. Um, and it's also why I'm not sure if there's reason to ask you where people can find out more about you and your work, although there are links where people can find out more about, say, the Conclave and resources um, that they can reach into beyond the Conclave uh, to that are related to 5-MEO DMT. So maybe you can leave us those links. I'll be sure to add them into the show notes to the episode. And if by the time this episode releases, you do the go-ahead that it can be a fully transparent, non-anonymous um, interview, I will include personal links to your stuff also in the show notes. Um, so maybe just sign us off with those links. Thank you. Yeah, I appreciate that. Uh, so yeah, you can see more about my work as well as I have a blog that has a lot of uh, five MEO DMT and Bufo Alvarius related uh, articles or blog posts or whatever we call those. Uh, so that's at chadcharles.net. And the work that I do with 5-MEO DMT is called, I call it the breath of five. And so when you go to that part of the website, you need a password and you can contact me directly via the site in order to get that password. I'm not going to share it with you here on this podcast. And as I'm a part of the five hive, which is the um, five exclusive five related forum um, that I set up with Rafael Lancelotta is five uh, meo dmt.org. And we've talked about the Conclave a lot uh, in this interview, and the Conclave has a landing page, and it is theconclave.info, not conclave.info. <laughs> what an amazing website that was. The oh, my God. Yeah. <laughs> but the Conclave. Yeah, yeah, Please yeah. don't get mixed up with those. <laughs> and you'll find all of the Conclave's documentation offered there for free to whoever wants it. Great. Thanks. I, uh, you mentioned your full first and last name and direct links. So I may or may not remove those depending on what your decision is afterwards. So if there's an awkward cut for the listeners, you'll know why. Uh, again, won't say your name, but uh, thank you very much for sharing what you shared on the show today, being here with us the list and the larger AtMind community and for what you're uh, efforting towards achieving for the larger 5MEO community as well. <laughs> Thank you so much. I enjoy you immensely <laughs> and uh, really appreciate being here with you. <laughs> Thank you. And cut. So that concludes this episode of Adventures Through the Mind with Chad Charles, episode 113, the last episode of 2019. Thank you so much if you've been around for the whole year. Wow. And also thanks for sticking in for a two-hour podcast. God damn, appreciate that. Um, and I'm sure your friends and family will uh, during the holiday season when you voluntarily bring up 5-MEO DMT, the God molecule, uh, at the dinner table. I'm sure, I don't know about you, but I am sometimes uh, that, <laughs> that family member, the psychedelic sheep in the family. Uh, so I have lots of... Lots of stuff in my uh, in my quiver uh, for, <laughs> for this adventure over the holidays. And now you do too. So awesome. Uh, speaking of holidays and end of the year, 
As I mentioned in the beginning, this podcast has taken a two-episode release break and will be resuming again on January 31st for my little holiday time, but also to double down on uh, sort of the larger ecology of content that I am producing and to uh, get geared up for a awesome podcasting year, 2020, clear vision. Um, so yeah, feeling excited about that. If you're not already following me on social media at James W. Gesso, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, that's where I'll be releasing content because I will be releasing content over the month of January, particularly clips from older episodes, which I'm going to be working on getting out and putting on the new at mine clips channel. Please subscribe, please. I need more subscribers on the at mine clips channel. Um, to make more shareable bits uh, for the social media world to get those sort of like moments of, wow, the guest really offered something profound. And it's kind of hard to ask somebody to watch a two-hour podcast um, when it's only like a five-minute clip that you want them to see. So be working on that as well. So follow me on social media to stay abreast to those things releasing and uh, the larger body of other stuff. So yeah, thanks for that. And... Yeah. Um, like if you're watching this on YouTube, I'm trying to figure out how to not, I'm like trying to figure out how to use like this camera and I got this kind of like cheap, but like not super cheap ring light. Um, trying to figure out how to make my face look good and clear on this channel, but I feel like I'm a little washed out. If you got some tips for me, tweet at me on how to, how to mod modulate it. I've been playing, I think I did pretty good this time over the last time, but we'll see. Um, anyways, I'm rambling. Thank you, and I will see you in 2020. Have an excellent new year, and um, enjoy doing whatever you're going to do uh, to bring that in. Take care.